I don't mind if y'all move this way if you want to do that. I won't be offended at all. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can do that. This is the third study in our series, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. And um, these are five of the stories. When I use the word story, I don't mean that they're not real events. I know they were events in Israel's history, but they're stories from Scripture that help us grasp a spiritual truth that I think, I think these are very important ones. And um, we'll look at, a, at a, a principle sort of with each one of them as we go along. Last week, we read the story of Israel at the Red Sea with the Egyptians bearing down on them from behind and the sea in front of them and and the people immediately panic and, and begin to tell Moses, uh, weren't there graves enough back in Egypt that you brought us out here? And, and uh, why'd you bring us out here in this wilderness to die? And uh, we told you we were better off back there as slaves than we would be out here and all of that. Do you remember anything from the reading last week? that Israel, I mean, God fought for them. Remember, remember the way He fought for them. Do you remember anything that Israel had to do while God fought for them? Were there any things that you remember that Israel, the, uh, the part that they played in that story, what they were asked to do? All right, they, they, the Hebrew writer says they did it by faith in Hebrews 11 and verse 29. But what else did they have to do in that story? Remember any of it? Do what? All right, they were told, the, the three S's really. Uh, stand still, be silent, and see the salvation of the Lord. So stand, be silent, or silence, and see. What did they have to be silent about? The murmuring, the complaining, the stuff that they were saying to Moses, which was, uh, which was uh, suggesting that God would have been better to be back there with Pharaoh's gods than it would be uh, to be out here with the Lord. It was... It was, a, 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 it was muttering that God could not endure and would not. So, so stand, silence, and see. And then when, God's, when they saw what God did, what else did they have to do? What did, what did doing something by faith, what was it that they did by faith? They walked through the sea on dry ground. They, they actually went forward when God told them to go forward. And, and they had, so the, the, a lot of times in these kind of illustrations like these stories here, uh, it'll be pictured like it's either, it's either belief or faith or it's work or action. And I, I just want to point out that these two things are not enemies the, 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 the right kind of work, which means response to God's action, is a necessary aspect of walking by faith. It always has been. And these episodes help us to see that. Do you remember the memory verse? I'm, I hope I didn't tell you this wrong. I said Exodus 15 and verse 2 last time. And uh, I'll just call your attention to that principle that we wanted to leave with, uh, with ourselves, with our minds. I want, to, I want to make sure I don't say it wrong. Uh, the Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. That's a great verse. If you're, a, if you're an underliner, underline that one, or highlighter, highlight that one. Exodus 15 and verse 2. Yeah. <laughs> I also said last week we're going... I said we were going to be in 1 Samuel, so I can see how we could get the connection here. So turn to 1 Samuel, everybody, for tonight. And this one, the phrase I've chosen is, For the battle is the Lord's. And this is from 1 Samuel 
Uh, chapter 17 and verse 47. Um, I don't know what your favorite Bible story is, but if I ask which stories all of us know, this one would be one of them. Who are the two main characters in this chapter? David and Goliath. You can't think of one without thinking of the other one, can you? David and Goliath. Uh, and, and I read the phrase somewhere. I think I read it in something I actually wrote. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the episodes in the Bible which is easy to remember and hard to learn. And what I mean, mean by that is we all sort of know the story, but I, I want to illustrate to you in the beginning here that it's been a principle which has been hard for God's people to grasp and to keep hold of and to hold fast in, in their lives. And it still is one where we, we kind of, uh, we can tell the story, but if someone stops and asks us, wait, now what does that mean? I think a lot of us would have trouble maybe getting past, well, uh, David walked out there and slung his stone and the giant fell, you know, that, that sort of thing. So I want to paint a little background to it to start with. This, this story, in my opinion, actually starts in 1 Samuel chapter 8. You need to look back there with me for a second. 1 Samuel 8, you remember what happened here. The, Samuel is the prophet. Samuel has become old. The people get a little uh, uneasy and so forth, and they start asking for something. What do they start asking for? So they could be like a nation, like everybody else. We want a king. And please notice verse 20 especially. Uh, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and do what? Fight our battles. When, when, when Samuel heard that, Samuel was brokenhearted over it, and God told him, verse 7 of this same chapter, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. How had they rejected God from being king over them? All right, that, that's, that's true, but look at that phrase right there. Why did they want a king like the nations? What did they want him to do? Fight their battles. So if they rejected God from being king over them, what, how have they rejected God? From fighting their battles. They've decided we're not comfortable with the battle belonging to the Lord. We would rather have him to have the battle to belong to a, our king like everybody else. That's, that's the gist of this. Now, God in answering uh, that uh, plea ended up giving them whom for the first king or who? Saul. Why did he give them Saul? He was an outstanding physical specimen. He was outwardly, he was physically impressive. In fact, 1 Samuel 9 verse 2 says that Saul was a handsome young man. Uh, there wasn't anybody more handsome than him. Uh, he was shoulders up, from shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. We would say head and shoulder. He stood above them head and shoulder. So, so this is a king like the nations had, a physically impressive fellow who looked like if there was a battle, he's a guy for it. He's the, he's the big guy who would go out here and defeat the enemy. So, so far you, you see what's happening, don't you? Now, chapter 16, verse 7. In between here in chapter 13 and 15, Saul demonstrates a heart which is unwilling to obey God. He offered an unlawful sacrifice, which the priest should have done, and then made excuses. Then he, uh, he uh, did not wait for Samuel to come and took thing in his, things in his own hand and then tried to say did it, the people did it and so forth. Um, he disobeyed God, and God rejected him from being king. Who was the next person that God 
chose or gave Israel to be their king, to fight their battles for them. David. All right, now why did he choose David? So not somebody who was more handsome than everybody else and head and shoulders above everybody else, but somebody whose heart uh, was, was one that, wanted, that sought after God, right? Look at 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. All of you know this, uh, I think. Um, he got, he, remember all of his efforts to anoint other sons of Jesse? He finally gets all the way down to the youngest one after he's passed through all the rest of them. And, um, and, and God has him to finally an, uh, anoint David. But the explanation is in verse 7. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. For the Lord sees not as man... And I, I, I've, uh, he, he goes ahead to say, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Samuel got to Jesse's house and looked for the tallest and strongest looking fellow and thought, surely this will be the king. God sent him instead to a young man named David who looked physically unimpressive, at least at that point, and, and the, the explanation is that the Lord doesn't see kings or champions or warriors the way God does. That lesson proved in Israel's history to be so hard to remember. When the captivity is looming, after all of their failures, their divisions and failures and so forth, in Jeremiah 9 in verse 23 Please look over there to see what people tend to, how people send, tend to see other people and tend to evaluate or to value people, to, to, to determine someone's standing. Look at it. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast on his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Now, if God looked on a person's heart and chose that way, why is he having to say this, uh, you know, 500 years later to the same people? All right. Do we? So basically, they are evaluating. The standing of people based on who's the smartest, who's the strongest, and who has the most stuff. Do you know anyone who evaluates the worth and standing of people by those, any of those means? Who's the smartest, who's the strongest, or who has the most stuff? Who is the most highly educated, who's the most athletic, and who is the richest do you know anybody who evaluates the standing of people that way? Most everybody in the world, when? Right now. Not, not just then, right now. So this, is a, this principle that we're getting at here is, is easy to remember, or this story, but hard. It has a point that's hard to learn. It has to do with who fights our battles, and whether we determine that the way God sees the warrior or the way man sees the warrior. So we, we need to set the scene for our standoff here in uh, 1 Samuel 17. And Miss Ruth has taught this in her class. I'm, I'm not sure how many times, but, uh, but this, you have to have this in your mind and envision it here. here here's a valley that runs westward, westward out from Bethlehem in the south of Judah. And that's very important for this story because this valley gave access to the hill country of Judea, the hill country of Judah. This, the security and the commerce of the land is at stake in the battle for control of this valley. And here comes the Philistine army. Who are the Philistines in this point in, with relation to Israel? 
The worst enemies always had been. These are the people, God. when God brought them up out of Egypt, God said, wait a minute, if I take them up through the land of the Philistines, they're going to see how powerful those people are, and they're going to turn around and come back. So I'm going to take them around. Now then, these Philistines are the problem. They're on one side, on one mountain, and, and, and Saul brings his, the Israelite army on another mountain, and they stand with a valley in between, of, in between them, and they just stand there and look at each other. There's a standoff. It's an ominous and threatening and scary situation. Who's going to act next? You know, it's like, the, it's like a, my, my grandparents used to like the wrestlers on, on the old black and white TV, and they get out there in that, in that ring, you know, go back and forth like that before they pounce on each other. That's kind of how this is, except in this case, what happens involves a, an ancient practice of warfare back then, whereby each side would choose a champion, Instead of all of them just getting out there and engaging in the fight, they choose each one of them a champion, and they go out and fight where everybody can see, and who, whichever champion defeats the other one, he shares his victory with the people on his side, and nobody else has to suffer for it. Pretty, pretty good arrangement unless you were the losing champion or represented by the losing champion. So that's happened here. So here comes now the, the one to take the first step in this practice is the Philistine side. And a resident of the Philistine city of Gath steps forward, and his name is Goliath. You ever have a dog named Goliath? I remember in a cartoon when I was growing up, a dog, he was always a big bad dog if, if, if there was one. This, this fellow is intimidating in appearance. I figured up some of the details that were given about him in verses 4 through 7. Everything, he's arrogant with good reason. Everything about him, from the way his size, the way he's dressed, to how he shouts out his chat, all of it is calculated to be as intimidating as possible. He's a huge physical specimen first. He towers to, depending on what you read, somewhere between seven and nine feet tall which would pretty much get your attention, I'd say. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be outstanding. His armor was the very finest that a skilled Philistine artisan could make or buy. It, it's made out of bronze. It, it covers almost his entire body. Verses 5 through 7 tells us. He wears a coat of mail, or one another translation says it's a coat, it's a... a uh, a, a, scale, a scaled armor, a coat of scales, which weighed, according to the detail we're given, about 125 pounds by, by itself. Uh, if I figured it up right, chapter 17, verse 5, he has, a, depending on what you read, either a javelin or a saber strung across his back. He carries a spear like a weaver's beam, the head of it's made of iron, and just the head of the spear weighs about 15 pounds by itself. His shield bearer, he has a shield bearer, another, another Philistine who carries his shield before him, which is a large standing shield um, that would cover his whole body. Verse 7 tells us he shouts out a challenge in a manner that's calculated to stir fear. And the shout is, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down here to me. And then he explains, if he kills me, uh, you win. If I kill him, we win. You'll be our servants and so forth. And he has to punctuate it with this shout, verse 10. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. What's the, what do you see happening in the Israelite line? 
Do they stand there just facing him? Do they just put their heads down? Do they say, hold me back, hold me back? Or are they just looking down the line to see if anybody's moving? There's no, there's no big action, is there? No big response to that. And uh, th th you, so you have a very intimidating appearance and a very defiant challenge. Now, I need to stop and ask you. Now, according to all rights, knowing why Judah wanted the king, why Israel wanted the king, and knowing the king God gave them, who should have gone out to fight this battle? Who was the logical choice? Saul, why? He was the biggest. All right, he was the biggest. But also, they wanted the king to fight their battles. All right, you got a battle. What's Saul supposed to do? Get out there and get with it, man. Show why, you're, show why you're the king. Instead, what does Saul do? Apparently, the only thing that we know is that he offered a ridiculous reward to, if somebody else would go. You know, I'll make it worth your while, man. Just uh, go out there and take care of that little old guy. And uh, I'll see that you're well paid for it. That type of thing. Um, but verse 11 says, when Saul... And all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were what? They were, first they're dismayed and greatly afraid. What does dismayed, how is dismayed and greatly afraid different? They're shaking in their boots. So one of them has to do with the actual fear and the other has to do with the overwhelming discouragement that accompanies it, the sense of helplessness that, 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 that goes with this. We better hurry or we'll leave them standing in the valley here tonight with this one. Now, second, the next step with this is, I think the thing we have to ask is, all right, so what's missing from that picture so far? All right, what about God in this picture? Uh, what about God? So this goes on for 40 days. We find out in verse 16, uh, uh, Goliath comes forward and takes his stand morning and evening. First thing every morning, last thing every night is, choose a man and let him come out and fight. Give me a man. Wonder how you sleep and... What kind of a mood you wake up in, if that's the first, last sound you hear, first sound you hear every morning. But in the meantime, David, who has been tending his father's sheep in Bethlehem and coming back and forth to where Saul's army is, uh, apparently either to check on his, his, his three older brothers who are there, or maybe, as in this case, to bring supplies at this point, David arrives. His father has sent him, according to verse 17. He's brought to supplies. He, uh, he, he goes down there. I love the way verse 19 says it. Saul and all of them. Uh, now Saul and they, and they, that's his brothers, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah doing what? <laughs> Fighting with the Philistines. Uh, some fight, isn't it? So they're there, all right, but th there's no fight going on. There's only a threat and intimidation and then the resulting fear. So uh, while David is just getting there and uh, leaving, th leaving the baggage to where it belongs and so forth, old Goliath comes out, verse 23. And he hollers out, he comes out to the, from the ranks of the Philistines, and he hollers out the same words as before, uh, which, which we have read already. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, please notice something interesting in, in this 
it, it tells us that verse 24, the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And it goes ahead to talk about some of their talk between themselves that we'll come back to in a minute. Um, but notice that the end of verse 23 says, and David heard him. It just struck me for some reason the difference between David hearing while everybody else only saw. And there's a particular thing that David hears that I'd like you to notice with me. Uh, in verse 26, you can see it. David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, which means he's not in covenant relation to God, that he should defy? And then there's this one detail that David hears and adds to this that hasn't been mentioned yet. What does David hear, and what note does David hear missing in this? Verse 26 there, look at it. The armies of the living God. Not just the armies of Saul, but the armies of the living God. His, his brothers and the others with them saw the giant and heard what he said, and, and saw all of that and feel, feel the fear. But David hears... And David cares about, where, where's God in this story? Where, there, there's this Philistine, but where's God in this story? Now, please think about something that David would have known that might play a role here. Look back at Deuteronomy 20 with me for just a second. Everybody, if you will, I think this helps explain some of the action of this story. Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 through 4. This is what the law called for. When you go out to war against your enemies, now where's where, where Saul and the army of Israel right now? They've gone out there on the mountain to war against their enemies. So would this apply? Yeah, this should have been uh, applicable. And you see horses and chariot and an army larger than your own. What were they seeing out there in the valley when old Goliath walked out? A champion larger than their own, for sure. Then he said, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you're drawn near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Now, from what we've already introduced to you tonight, why did they not remember that passage? Let me read the last of it again, see if you make the connection that I make with this. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. All right. All right, they had already chosen somebody else to fight their victory. Therefore, when this giant bigger than them comes out to challenge them, they have to go by their own power, and there they are. They're, they're afraid and so forth. So there's, there's the, the, the scene, and there's the, the, the place of God in this. I just want to mention, we don't have much time to do this, but, but people, I think the actions of the, the other, other uh, soldiers from the army of Israel who are present there with David, uh, when David is having this conversation with his older brother, I think their statements are revealing 
when we start comparing ourselves with people who are wiser than we are or stronger than we are or have more riches than we have and a sense of inferiority settles down over us and we start, I, well, there, there's the challenge, but here's a, I couldn't do much against him and so forth. And then start seeing how they interact with each other. We should ask whether this happens to the, for one thing, they see the giant, but they feel, uh, no, this is people who've compared themselves with people. There you go. For, first thing is, they've gotten so used to seeing this every morning and even for 40 days that they don't feel any personal responsibility in this. They just see it happen. The people tell David, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. And what they're missing there is, why hasn't anybody? You got this kind of reward hanging over? Nobody's done a thing. Notice how easily you get used to thinking, I'm not responsible for this. It's not my job. Nothing I can do. The second thing that happens is people become oversensitive and irritated. David is just asking what, and easily irritated. David just asking, what will be done to the man, uh, for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the approach of, the, and his oldest brother in verse 28, hears this, and is, he gets angry with David, and he says, why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the presumption and evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. It's like you have no business here. Uh, go, yeah, go home, kid. Let us grown-ups handle this. That's sort of the idea, yeah. Uh, and, and then next they can spread the sense of inability and, and negativity to somebody who's willing to try. In verses 31 through 33, David, the, the words that David spoke were heard, and they, were, they, they worked themselves down the line to Saul. And David said to Saul, verse 32, Let no man's heart fail because of him, your servant. In other words, I will go and fight against the Philistine. And Saul put his arm around him and said, Thank God you're just the fellow I've been looking for and waiting for. Is that what he said? What he said. You're not able. Was, was Saul pronouncing a word on David or was Saul expressing his own evaluation of himself and his army? You're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him for your buddy youth. He's been a man of war from his youth. You're a youth and he's been a man of war from his youth. You can't. And, and judging by all outward appearances, was Saul right? Yep. If you went just based on who's wisest, who's strongest, who's richest, Saul was right. David would not have been able. But remember what got left out of the picture? All right, the living God. And, and that, that's the issue here. And then the other, the other thing is the, the, the humorous part of this to me is then Saul overcompensates for his own sense of inadequacy. David has decided he's going to go. So what does Saul do to help him out? All right. All right. Saul, Saul stands head and shoulders above anybody else in Israel. He's got a youth here, probably skinny and all that stuff. And uh, well, Saul says, you're not able, but since you're going here, take my armor. He straps it on, oh, David, and all that. And David can't even move with it. He hadn't trained in it. It doesn't fit him and all of that. So, so what is Saul doing here? Does he really think he's helping? 
Or is he salving his own uh, conscience about his own thing? I think, I think his own in inadequacy is present with that. All right, so time, time evaporates here. So now then, here's a real champion's heart. If you want to see what God saw in David's heart when he had Samuel to anoint him to be king in Saul's place, this is a good place to look. Verse 32 now, now uh, in, in, this, uh, in this text, uh, David says, I'm the one, I'll go. Your servant will go fight with this Philistine. But he said something else, let no man's heart fail because of him. David wants the spirit of the attitude of his fellow Israelites to not be dismayed and afraid uh, he's, he's, he wants to have an effect on the heart of his, of his brothers and, and others of the people. And then uh, when Saul had reasoned with, with him about it, David said, you know, I, I kept sheep from my father when there was a lion or a bear that attacked and tried to take something from our flock, from my father's flock. I went after him. I didn't stand here and on the mountain and watch him. My, my paraphrase, I struck him and I delivered it out of his mouth. If you can imagine that picture, a lion or a bear, they're carrying off one of your sheep. And you don't just try to run him off. What you're trying to do is get that sheep back. Which means that you're going to have to. So David said, if he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. That's not the way we used to do it, but that's what David said that he said that he he did, and David took it a step farther. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. But David gives a reason. What's his reason? Right, for he has defied. The armies of the living God. David was not just bragging on himself and acting better than everybody else. He saw God's place in this. So, so the idea is the Lord, and this is, an, uh, this is a wonderful statement, verse 37, the Lord who delivered me, some of the versions translate the word saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will save me from the hand of this Philistine. How, what, is the, what is the nature of David's reasoning there? What's the basis of his reasoning? Right, but how does he know that? All right, what's happened before? God's already delivered me from dangerous situations, and now that his name is at stake, he will do so even more. And so Saul said to David, go, and what else? Why hadn't Saul thought of this before? Saul didn't say, go, and I'm right here to fight Israel's battles. I'll go with you. This tells you a lot about Saul's heart. Saul failed because... He didn't want the Lord to go with him. He didn't wait for the Lord. He didn't let the Lord fight his battles. But when David was ready to go, Saul didn't want to go himself. He wanted the Lord to go with David. And to go with David means, may the Lord fight your battles. May the Lord go before you and fight your battles. So David takes his staff and five smooth stones and his sling. And he doesn't just stand there in line and wait. He goes out and he approaches old Goliath. He approaches the, the Philistines, the enemy lines all lined up there. You got to think of what a ridiculous looking sight this must have been. Old, old Goliath and all of his armor and his armor, his shield bearer and all of that, and the mighty Philistine army lined up behind him and a, and a youth fresh from seeing after his father's flock with a walking stick or his shepherd's staff, five stones out of a creek, and a slingshot. And here he's coming after you. 
So how does old Goliath respond to this? this well, you see the clash of values that's at stake here. Here is Goliath who represents a man of idolatry. He's going to, his gods are, are Dagon and, um, uh, who's the other one? Ashroth, uh, Ashroth, Asher, 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 I can't think of which the name it is. But the two Philistine gods were the disgusting uh, idols who were worshipped and, and, and worshipped with immorality and cruelty and so forth. Here comes old Goliath with his armor and his shield and his weaponry making a big show of it. Verse 38 and following says, and he sees David and he doesn't say, finally a man worthy of fighting with me. He says instead, he just, he's just insulted by the whole deal. He looks at David and disdains him because he's a, Ruth, he's a youth who is ruddy and handsome in appearance. I don't, does ruddy mean red or what does that, it just, just, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, the Philistine said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And he curses David, which doesn't just mean he puts foul language on him, but it means he curses him, places curses on him by his gods. So the real issue here, as had been the case with Pharaoh and Egypt, is the gods these pagans worship. It's not just between Goliath and David, it's between the gods of the Philistines and the God of Israel. That's a way to think of this. And now then, here comes David, the man of God. Verse 45 the, uh, says, and, and you come to me with sword and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you've defied. That frames the issue very well. And you see the contrast to what just went before and, uh, and then he, he explains why he has come. It, the Lord's going to deliver you into my hand. Verse 46 says at the start, um, uh, it will lead to the defeat of all of the Philistines. My paraphrase, look at the end of verse 46. The first that, this is the purpose of David, that all the earth may know what? That there is a God in Israel. Don't you love that? that all the earth, everybody may know there is a God in Israel, not an idol like there is in, in, in Philistia. And then, and then the second that, verse 47, and that all this assembly, who do you mean? Both armies, Israel and the Philistines, all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. Don't you like that? There is a God who saves, but he doesn't do it with swords and spears and armor like Goliath has on. Not that way at all. And that leads up to our wonderful statement that this study tonight is based on, verse 47. For the battle is the Lord's. What did he mean by that? To say that the battle is the Lord means what? It means he'll win, doesn't it? That he, that he will determine the victory, that it, he will decide the outcome of this. And I think that's the issue. And notice that David says, oh, and, and he will give you into, what does he say? Our hands. How could he say that? Well, he's, 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 he's Israel's champion in this case. And uh, his victory would be not just his, but also for the people of God. So he runs toward old Goliath and toward the Philistine lines. He puts his hand in his pouch, takes one of the stones, slings it, and it strikes Goliath's forehead and penetrates his forehead. And old Goliath falls which way? on his face, face down. So he not only suffers defeat, he faces humiliating defeat, if you think about it. David prevailed 
with sling and stone, no sword, but the Lord. Verse 50, the Lord was... and you, So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and with the stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David, but there was something in the heart of David. What was it? It was loyalty in the Lord to the Lord and confidence in the Lord. To David, the Lord was king. To David, the Lord fights the battle of the people he rules. Now, that brings us to the memory verse from last week. This is my God. He still fights the battles of the people who are ruled by him. And, and um, we have to ask ourselves, I think, eventually, whether, whether we have made the choice of Saul, that is, the people choosing the, the most impressive person outwardly, or whether we have made the choice of David, which God made a man after God's own heart. Uh, and whether, 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 we, uh, whether we can see that God fights for us in that way. I mentioned that a champion shares the triumph that he gains with his people. So think about the way we have a share in this triumph. And I think we do. Uh, for the purposes of that David specified in verses 46 and 47, God is known to us for who He is, partly by the story of David and Goliath. If you want your children to know God, you have to start by teaching them these stories where God made Himself known. Secondly, Israel is encouraged to do the right thing. Now they've, they've been there 40 days lined up on two sides of the valley. Now then they get up and they chase the Philistines and they leave all the way from there to Gath. They leave fallen Philistines beside the road in a way. And then they come back and take the, the plunder of the camp. And then David is established in the king's court at the end of this chapter, which becomes an important thing going onward, and we're given a, a glimpse of the real basis of personal significance. I'd like you to go back with me to Jeremiah 9 now. Jeremiah 9, I, I read verse 23 about not glorying and not boasting in wisdom or might or riches, Verse 24 says, But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And I think that is the truth that gets known in the story of David here. God delighted in a man who boasted in him and knew him. And God uh, tended to the love and justice and righteousness that he mentioned here. It's a great story. And I hope you'll reread it and reflect on it. Your memory verse for next week is Jeremiah 41 and verse 10. Here's what it says. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that a great verse? And the, and the reading for the class for next week for you to do ahead of time is Second Chronicles chapter 20. The story of King Jehoshaphat. So if you'll please read that story uh, next week, we'll think about it. Brendan, how about standing up and re leading us in a prayer before we go, if you don't mind? Father, thank you for the time to give us a chance to 
always remember to look at you. Know that you can have that same trust, that faith in you. You'll be there for us, whatever we're going through. But once we show us, we have that same trust. Father, we thank you for what you're always doing for us. We pray that you give those who remember them to serve us. Father, you and us as we go to our separate homes. So much for your side. We pray this Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Everybody have a good rest of the week. Keep cool tomorrow.